There is a calling within each of us, a desire, a drive, I believe, to harness that awakening, to live aware and awake. Because we wouldn't be here in this sanctuary of consciousness if we haven't had glimpses of that, if we haven't had moments of that, if we haven't had times when we recognize that this is what it's all about. There is a place in consciousness, a place in mind. Scripture calls it heaven. We call it heaven consciousness. People call it afterlife, within life. They have all different ways to describe it. Some people call it enlightenment. Some people call it awakening. Some people call it elusive. But when you've tasted a glimpse of it, when you tasted a glimpse of what is beyond the duality, what is beyond the paradox, what is beyond that teeter-totter, of the human condition. Is that what it's called, a teeter, a seesaw? Seesaw? I've gotten in trouble with this for talks before and had people come up to me after and say, it's not a teeter-totter, it's a this, it's a that. But that's the human condition, right? It's our spiritual self, woo, and then our human condition, oh. And we can feel like we are on this ride. But what happens when we step back and we begin to see with spiritual vision, we begin to see with spiritual eyes, we begin to practice spiritual principles, what happens is that we simply enjoy the ride. Not enjoy in a light sense, not enjoy the way the world tells us that if I have my needs met, if I have exactly what I want, I have joy. If I have more money, if I have more stuff, if I have this, that, this, that, then I have joy. That's not the kind of joy, right, that we're talking about. That's not the kind of enjoyment we're talking about. We're talking about the enjoyment that makes everything sweet. It makes the tears sweet, and it makes the love sweet. It makes the moment sweet in a way that passes all understanding, in a way that goes beyond human judgment of good and bad, light and dark, joy and pain. I think that is our calling while we're here in these earth suits to live like we're dying. Osho, the great spiritual teacher, said, experience life in all possible ways, good, bad, bitter, sweet, dark, light, summer, winter. Experience all the dualities. Don't be afraid of experience because the more experience you have, the more mature you become. The more spiritually mature we become. The illusion of a spiritual practice that lures us in sometimes is thinking we'll avoid all of that. The spiritual practice will help me get over the good and the bad, not have it anymore. I think that's like saying get over it when someone passes. You know, some people have the idea that as time goes by, I will get over that. I don't think that we ever get over that. I think we get comfortable with it. We get more used to it. We begin to find ourselves, the new self, within the new physical reality. So the spiritual practice then is about something deeper. It is about something far greater. It is about finding a rhythm in life and finding a sweetness in life. If you could find out the what, where, when, how, the cause, the moment of your death, would you? If you could find out, you could have someone tell you right now, would you opt to find out? Let's do a survey. It says, if you would, raise your hand. We got a couple. We got a couple takers. And if you wouldn't, raise your hand. Okay. It's an interesting thing to think of, isn't it? It's an interesting idea to contemplate. If you could know, would you? Would you find out? If you could find out and you did find out, or you chose not to find out, what would be your motivation? What would it make you conscious of? My bet is that for the many that would like to find out, it would help them with this, live like you're dying. 
help them cherish each moment. No, I'm not going to close that door after an argument and not pick up the phone right away. I'm not going to speak in this way. I'm not going to waste this moment. I'm not going <laughs> to sit in for another hour of TV on this May day. Right? I mean, has anyone felt that with this May weather? I've been like, oh, movie? I can't go to a movie. Oh, do th- I, can't go- I can't go anywhere inside. I have to be outside with the poppies, with the grass, with the hostas, everything so I can cherish this moment, this miracle moment, right? So I have a hunch that that's one of the reasons we'd want to know. I also have a hunch that's one of the reasons why we wouldn't want to know, right? Because what happens in the mind when we have thoughts or ideas, we begin to sometimes create stories around them or live from them, right? We begin to live less freely if something is captivating our mind. Like if we think, okay, I have six days left. Six days left. What can happen is we can either free ourselves or we can paralyze ourselves, right? So I'm guessing in the answer to that question, you know your mind. You know your mind. It's a good thing to know thyself, isn't it? Because when we practice our unity principles and we practice our unity teachings, we know that through the law of mind action, we can activate our experience in our reality and we can create either a heaven or a hell of that time that we are very conscious and aware of. And consciousness and awareness are the key. Consciousness and awareness are the key. Knowing our minds, knowing our time, and being conscious of how to use it. That's why this topic is even relevant here in a spiritual community rather than, oh, what does that have to do with God? What does that have to do with my spiritual practice? How I spend my time? How much time I have left? What does that have to do with it? Why isn't that just in a self-help class or in a uh, taking responsibility for your life class? Why? Because we're here to be vibrantly alive. We're here to be awake. We're here not to be mesmerized by the rhythms of the human condition so much that we begin to sleep. But to have activation of those moments that keep us awake, that remind us of what we really are. That's why we come together. That's why we read. That's why we practice. That's why we pray. That's why we meditate. To stay aware. To stay conscious. The spiritual practice is about being awake. It's not about time management. How much can I get done so that I can live my passion, live my dream, so that I can prosper my books or my this or my that? Those are still all ego, right? Anything that's formed is just ego and human condition. Now, that may be used for a mighty purpose. It may be all good and beautiful stuff. But the spiritual practice is about being awake. The spiritual practice is about shifting from moments of illusion to moments of divine reality. We're born here to be demonstrating life. Life that has no opposite, true living. In Matthew 5, 14, it says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lamp stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. And this whole process is to glorify heaven consciousness, to glorify source consciousness, to celebrate divine consciousness. But if we're asleep, we know we have long periods where we don't do that. And that's just part of being alive. It's just part of the human condition, knowing that we fall asleep. But we're here to cherish and not take for granted every moment, and that's living a godly life, isn't it? You can feel it, right? When you're cherishing the moment, when you see beyond black and white, I don't really want to bring this up, but it just is up. So there's a show that I watch called Nashville. <laughs> it's a bit of a nighttime fun soap opera, but, um, but it has all this music, singer-songwriters in it. And anyway, 
not, well, if, if you don't watch it, you don't care, and if you watch it, you already saw this one. So there's a relationship where someone is a father to a daughter, and um, she's going through some um, life awakenings and pushing her boundaries and exploring herself in ways that can make parents uncomfortable. Um, and if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. And um, there's this dad in her life that didn't know he was her father. You can tell this is soap opera. Didn't know he was her father for a long time, right? And so he's just found this out. So he has this experience with this daughter where, you know, you're supposed to kind of come down hard or, um, you know, be a disciplinarian or, or like, and, and he's, he, he's reiterating that he, he hasn't had the prep of a whole lifetime as a dad to even know how to show up right now. So they're both not knowing how to show up in this awkward situation. And then there's a moment where he, he comes back and kind of communicates with her the first time. And he makes note of the awkwardness of the situation, how this normally would be considered bad. But he is so grateful not to be missing it, not to be missing it. Or oh, the other pieces, he has a diagnosis and he might die if he doesn't get a liver transplant. <laughs> now you know how I spend my time. <laughs> We're praying he gets the liver transplant. <laughs> no, <laughs> we really like him on the show. But it was a great moment where the show, the show burst through the duality, right? It burst through this, you know, paradigm of how we're supposed to react and how we're supposed to show up and showed a moment of like authentic recognition that that's all it takes is like living like that, living like each moment is precious and being aware of it rather than just showing up for the human stuff. See, the human stuff has a whole different agenda, all different goals. The ego has all different goals, ideas, purposes, but the spiritual self always has one, only one, to show up, to love, to share compassion, to be authentic, and to presence this moment. To presence this moment. Do you believe that you have within you, that you were born within you, that you were designed with everything needed and necessary to overcome anything you feel like you need to overcome or to presence anything that may feel difficult? It's not something that we can give to someone else. I can't help you, you can't help me, you can't help someone else. You can't give to someone else and say, this is how you do it. We really can't. We try and we can point in directions, but we can't do that. But what we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if there is something before you in your life, if there is something you are given, that when you are given that something, when that something appears, so does appear, so is it true that there is within you the divine pattern for overcoming the divine pattern for your healing, for experiencing your wholeness, for experiencing your allness, for experiencing God in the midst of it, God being the grand overall design. All of that within us at the moment that there is anything unlike it, anything else. And we can look at each other and we can presence that for each other and that's how we heal. That's how we heal, by knowing that. One of the most powerful things I ever witnessed, well, multiple times I have been in the presence of folks who have had a diagnosis, and a diagnosis that um, had a, the idea of terminal before it, right? Terminal, a terminal diagnosis. And one of the most powerful, powerful moments in my spiritual life was witnessing someone presencing that story. Because to my mind at the time, it was an awful of awfuls. Like how could anyone spin this that it's okay or that it's good? And I was intimately involved in being able to see this beloved's process in something I think would have, I know, would have just devastated and ran me around. This beloved got really clear really fast. And with a terminal diagnosis shared that I 
may have this idea now of how and when from what I might pass. I've been given this concept of what my death is going to be caused by. But in the midst of that, had the awakening and the realization that even that information, even that information isn't necessarily real. Isn't necessarily real. Because just like anyone else, that person could pass from a car accident tomorrow. That person could pass from an accident they don't even know is going to happen, or something could happen to transform the science around whatever the diagnosis is, and the passing could never happen anyway, or may not happen for that reason. So to have that realization in the middle of it, and just say, I just got a glimpse of one option. One option. One possibility in a field of possibilities. See, that one possibility in a field of possibilities. To be able to have that awakening, to be able to have that realization that even though I got this idea that much of the world would think that's a very strong idea, that's a very solid thing, that is something that doesn't change, this this consciousness comes in that says, well, maybe that's it and maybe not. So how about just taking this as a light switch? Turn on the light. Turn on the light. Just like in the song, Live Like You Are Dying, turn on the light. I got an idea that within that idea was my emancipation. In that idea was the light going on, showing me to value every moment of my life, showing me more and more how I want to live, what my choices are really rooted and grounded on. You know, some of us have an easier time than others making choices based on our spiritual ideas rather than our human needs. But that light going on is a whole redirection. It's a whole energy field that bursts us into clarity. Bursts us into clarity. Does that clarity have to come only through diagnoses, only through serious awakenings? Does it have to come? Do we have to wait for that? No. We don't have to wait for that at all. That's what the spiritual practice is about. The spiritual practice is about having that awakening, regardless of the external circumstances. But sometimes we do have the external circumstances that wake us up. The spiritual life, though, the spiritual practice is to wake us up without information. To allow us to wake up without any information. Does that sound like faith? Charles Fillmore said, faith is the perceiving power of mind linked with the ability to shape substance. That part that perceives, that intuits, that gets it, that gets something. But maybe doesn't have the evidence. Maybe doesn't have the information. Maybe doesn't have the details. But we can live an entirely different way. And when we do, we break through illusions. We break through the illusion, too, that ideas of the world, that physical ideas, that what happens to us, has any power over us. We break through the illusion that what happens to us has any power over us. Fear is in our control. Our thoughts are in our control. Fear is simply a state of delusion about the future. It's all unreal. All of it is unreal. They may be possibilities, they may be probabilities, but none of it is a reality. None of it is a reality. And in fact, standing in that fear and feeding that fear only creates more of a probability, right? only creates more of a possibility because what we're doing is we're tuning ourselves into the field, into the vibration of exactly what we don't want to have happen. In the daily word reading today, it said, let it pass through us. 
Let the emotions pass through us. Charles Fillmore talked about the carnal mind. That was the mind that just does what it wants. It's the mind that is just very animalistic. It's the mind that will go and feed from those thoughts rather than presencing. It's the sense, spiritual, the very spiritual consciousness that feeds from the living water, that feeds from that it wishes, it wishes to expand. But the carnal mind is not here to just run rampant. The carnal mind is here to be directed. You need to get the bowl and feed it directly, not just let it eat wherever it wants to eat, wherever it wants to eat at any time. It has to be directed. And that's ours to do. Fear is in my control. How much energy does our world give to fear? A lot. Every moment we spend in that vibration, that field, that conversation, is not only wasted time, not only wasted time, but misdirected God force misdirected God energy, misdirected co-creative power. That doesn't mean not being aware of things. We can still let emotions pass through us. We can still have fear, have all of these emotions, and presence them. But the idea is to let them pass through us, not to become us. We can take steps to appreciate now. One of the steps is to always recognize in every moment, no matter how much our human selves will judge it as not enough, to recognize nothing is missing. Nothing is missing. Can we do that? Can we look at our lives with all the things that the world and our own selves say is missing and go, nothing is missing. Nothing is missing in this moment. I'm going to stand on that idea because just like I know I am born with what is needed within me, I know that there are things beyond my physical sight of vision, beyond my mind's ability to hear or to see. And that is faith. That is faith. To stand in the moment and to be the cause that makes that statement true. Nothing is missing. When I stand in that statement, I am the cause activating that truth. If I stand in this statement that there is always something missing, there is always not enough, it's always not good enough in this moment, then I am the cause of that. Has anyone ever looked at a picture of themselves like 10 years ago? 10 years ago, and, and, and really looked at yourself and said, I thought I was whatever, whatever, whatever then, right? I thought I was younger looking then lighter than, heavier than, whatever. Whatever it was, like at that moment, 10 years ago, you thought you weren't enough, right? You thought it wasn't good enough. Maybe you criticized your little self, your little sweetheart self. You criticized her or him and you said, oh, you know, and you remember that person. And now you'd go back and you'd be like, what I wouldn't give. What I wouldn't give for her with that bad haircut, whatever it is, for her with that, you know, It's an illusion. I like to tell myself in this moment, regardless of if I get better, value this me right now because this is the best it's ever going to be. <laughs> but see the trick? You could think that's a little depressing because you think it's going to be worse later. No, it's always right now. Right now, this is the best it's going to be. So love it. Love you. Love it. Because this is it, right? This is it. If it gets better, you're going to stand in this moment and say, this is the best it's going to be. And then we make that. We bloom where we're planted. We look at what is good. We call it good and we celebrate the good. That is how we transform our human condition. That's how we transform how we live. We look for the good and it's a practice, isn't it? It's a practice to look for the good. But when we begin to do it, we recognize that there is no situation, no circumstance, no experience that there is not good because good is God. And the God will be in everything, drawing out, shining forth, celebrating the good. 
there's a quote by Osho that talks about being sane. It talks about the mind and how to get into the sane mind rather than the insane mind that creates all of these illusions, that there's always something missing, that there's always something wrong that gets us out of cherishing this moment. Osho says, I'm simply saying that there is a way to be sane. I'm saying that you can get rid of all this insanity created by the past in you just by being a simple witness of your thought processes. It is simply sitting silently, witnessing the thoughts passing before you, just witnessing, not interfering, not even judging, because the moment you judge, you have lost the pure witness. The moment you say, this is good, this is bad, you have already jumped onto the thought process. It takes a little time to create a gap between the witness and the mind. Once the gap is there, you are in for a great surprise that you are not the mind. You are not the mind. That you are the witness, a watcher. And this process of watching is the very alchemy of real religion. Because as you become more and more deeply rooted in witnessing, thoughts start disappearing. You are but the mind is utterly empty. That's the moment of enlightenment. That is the moment that you become, for the first time, an unconditioned, sane, really free human being. Namaste.